This is the Pioneer Growing Point Agronomy Podcast. Welcome to the podcast that talks everything agronomy and only agronomy, tackling current agronomy topics, management strategies, and covering topics generated from our listeners. On this, on this episode, we will discuss current agronomy topics we're seeing in the field and also corn rootworm management. And now your hosts, DuPont Pioneer Field Agronomists, Josh Schaffner and Brian Buck. Well, Brian, you got a kind of a long break there, kind of on your honeymoon, so I'll certainly want to welcome you back to the show this week. Yeah, it's good to be back. Things, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like you're gone long, but when you're gone through that rapid growth phase in corn, things do change quite a bit. So, a uh, little bit's happened, Josh. I think we should start talking, you know, just currently what we're seeing out in the field, corn, beans, alfalfa, and then I think we'll rotate into talking about corn rootworm. Yeah, it's changed quite a bit since you've uh, been four weeks since you've been on the show, but obviously... You know, things progressing well. You know, we talked a lot of, for really the last two or three shows, we've talked about, you know, kind of recovering from the frost and whatnot, but that's kind of a in the distant memory now, and corn's really kind of at that bolt stage where, you know, we're approaching that, that need to waste high corn and we'll be chest high here shortly. And, 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 and beans in the same boat, you know, the 30 the inch rows are getting close to canopying in some cases, and we're kind of getting ready to, to tackle those post emerge applications, and the burners are starting to go out there for for water hemp management and things like that. But, uh, you know, really, Brian, this time of year, you know, at least from a corn standpoint, I really start thinking about corn rootworm. Yeah, and, you know, so I think, around, you know, corn rootworm, the hatch takes place. I think it started taking place, you know, around two to three weeks ago. Um, around that five to 600 GDU point is really when you start seeing a lot of the hatch. And I know you were out digging this morning and you are able to find some larvae that were actually probably a bit bigger than I would expect to see them. But, you know, we have had a lot of heat since March and sometimes we forget that after we frosted the corn off, it set it back just a little bit, maybe from a high standpoint or, you know, progression. So the rootworm are out there, the hatch has taken place. And if you start digging, you can start to find some pressure. Yeah, certainly this is just a great time when you're out walking your fields, you know, the corn's not terribly big. It's not pollinating. It's a good time to, to dig plants up and really take a look at, you know, how are your roots developing and things like that. But, but as you said, Brian, you know, sometimes we forget, you know, we have collected quite a few heat units, but the one thing about corn rootworm is they don't care about planting date. You know, you're going back to when you started collecting heat units where, you know, in this case, you know, maybe late March we are collecting heat units and they certainly, you know, the frost set the corn back, you know, seven to 10 days, but certainly, you know, it was just one or two cold nights and didn't slow down the development. So yeah, out digging larvae today. Um, I anticipated that I would find active larvae. I was maybe a little surprised at, at the size of some of the larvae already. They're, they're pretty developed and, and certainly probably entering the max feeding stage as we speak right now. Yeah, so entering that max feeding stage, the best thing you can go out and do, like we said, is dig ruts now, and you're, you're really looking for the larvae, maybe some feeding scars. Uh, and as the season progresses, you know, it's good to earmark. If you do go into a field and see quite a bit, uh, go out and dig them again to see how much damage they did do and how much pressure you have. You know, Josh, when you start really looking at corn rootworm management, you know, say you have a big problem, what can you do right now? Not a lot, is there? Not a lot we can do right now. <clears throat> I know we talked about it, you know, I think in our pre-planting show that that really when your corn planter leaves the field, your corn rootworm plan is is pretty much set. You're going to sit back and watch. Now again, there are some rescue treatments that you could look at some products that you could spray and try to time with the rain and other things, but you know, they're not terribly effective. So really if you're seeing pressure right now, um, unfortunately you just got to sit back and kind of watch it happen. But on the flip side, you got to be thinking about number one is the program I'm, that I my plan I had this spring is it working? That's why I like to be digging now. Number two, if you see a lot of activity, it really might encourage you to go back and look at, okay, how many beetles do we got? Could I potentially have a silt clipping problem? So it really does set the stage about, you know, maybe some potential management of adult beetles if it becomes necessary in some heavy pressure situations. Yeah, so really it's, you know, thinking long term, I think, as much as anything right now. So, you know, we're going to go out, assess some of that pressure, see if we do have some feeding. And then as we rotate into that, you know, end of July, beginning of August time frame, Josh, I think one thing that works really good is uh, using sticky traps to monitor, you know, adult pressure. It's not something you're going to do in every single field, but, you know, if you do find a field where you feel like you might have some pressure coming, I think it's a nice practice you can use to really gauge uh, how much pressure is out there. Oh, it's a great practice. And in my opinion, 
opinion, probably agronomically, one of the things we overlook more than anything is understanding um, and monitoring adult populations across the area. You know, Brian, you and I did some individually last year. Um, we had some some coworkers and other stuff that did some, but still, it wasn't a massive scale. But even that limited data that you and I generated last year was a huge benefit, um, just for making a few decisions this year because. Between our geographies, which are very close, you know, I cover extreme southeast. You kind of cover the the Highway 60 area north and to the west. I mean, we literally border each other, but our population counts were dramatically different. Yeah, and there's a fine line, you know. So you think about it in, in population counts, we're really looking at two different things. There's western corn rootworm that we deal with in Minnesota and also northern corn rootworm. Uh, and depending on rotations and some other things, there's some some different pieces that it's important to understand which species you have and how much you have of it. So uh, last year, I think one thing I saw interesting was, you know, down in Josh's area, closer to that, that Iowa border, you know, moving southern, south in Minnesota, it was more northern corn rootworm. And moving north, I saw more western corn rootworm. And Josh, when you think about that, you know, what's significant about that overall? Well, it's backwards in my opinion. The first thing you think about is we should have more northerns to the north and, and more westerns to the south. So, you know, obviously it was backwards, but, but Brian, it was very clear of what happened. And it just was boiling back to um, the extremely harsh winter we had a couple of years ago coming, I think it was the winter of 2012 and 13, where we had kind of that polar vortex became the, the term of that winter. And, and, you know, down in my district, we didn't establish snow cover very early where you did establish some snow cover. But, you know, down in my area, the extreme southeast Minnesota, you know, we had water lines frozen six feet underground. And, you know, some of the shop water didn't thaw out till June where it was just so cold. But, you know, westerns not being very nearly as hardy to that cold as, as northerns, you know, my western population just got devastated. And it was a huge thing because in 2012, my western population was out of control. Josh, and really, you know, the, the Western issue was what caused most of the problems in 2012. So, uh, you know, as you move north into my district, we saw more Western pressure last year, which is a little bit of a concern when you have, you know, a little bit more pressure last year. And then I, th I thought we had a pretty mild winter this year, pretty good snow cover. So you start thinking about that. There is a chance for pretty good populations as you move uh, really anywhere in Minnesota. But in some of the districts I have where there was more Western pressure in general, we could see quite a bit more this year. Yeah, and we'll see, certainly keep you up to date as, as we're going to dig a lot of roots for the next show. But really, Brian, I think it's a great opportunity to set up a, an agronomy project that we're going to do this summer around adult monitoring and sticky traps. Yeah, so a project we're going to do this year is we're going to go out on a wide scale. We're going to enlist our sales rep for us who are awesome on the ground and getting getting out in fields, and we're going to put up a ton of sticky traps. So the way they work is you go out and you place traps in the field. So you do six per field, and then you check them every week, and you take down the old ones and put up new ones. So when you go out in the field, you'll count. You'll see how many western beetles you have, how many northern beetles you have. And those beetles are the larvae that have, you know, went to the beetle form, emerged, and came up through the soil. So it's a great way to check pressure, but also know, understand, you know, what species are you getting pressure from. So it's a project that takes about four weeks, and it's it's a lot of work. You know, it's hot in August, you're out in the cornfields, but it's great data, and it's really a great setup for the next year. And really the value that, that we'll have from this for the growers that participate and let us do this, and, you know, Brian, when we get out in the winter and talk about our crop shops, is the only way you can predict pressure the next year is by monitoring adults. If I think back to 2012, where in my district in Southern Minnesota, we had some devastating damage, in some cases, literally crop failure because of corn rootworm. But all those signs were there the year before in 2011. So if you were out walking fields in summer 2011, all the signs were there. The problem is nobody walks the fields and looks for corn rootworm, adult beetles, Brian. So in most cases, you know, when I talk to our growers in the winter, I ask every grower I talk to all winter long, how many you scout for rootworm beetles? And out of the eight, nine hundred or a thousand growers, whatever it is I've talked to about corn rootworm, I've had one hand so far. Nobody does it. And it is the only way you can understand what to do next year. And that's an expensive decision, Brian. I mean, rootworm control is expensive, but you know, in some cases we're making some cutbacks to save a little bit here. If you don't know what your pressure is, you really just can't make a decision of what to do. Yeah, and depending on rotation, there's two different things we're looking at. If you're historic corn and you're going back to corn, you know, are those western populations growing enough where, you know, maybe you should layer an insecticide with that trait? And the other piece is if, you know, if it's corn on beans and you're in an area with extended diapause, which is the northern corn rootworm beetle or species, that's something you need to monitor too and say, hey, this is expanding. We've seen it quite a bit. You know, we need to use a trait corn on beans or corn, you know, in that situation yeah. also. Or when we find those heavy pressures, you know, I know Brian, you had a couple of fields last year that had heavy, you know, root feeding. 
you know, also had some high beetle, you know, counts as when the adults emerged. And you know, it was a situation where we rotated out, which is one of the best things we can do. I think they switched over to alfalfa. And, and again, in some cases, you know, knowing those heavy pressure fields were, yeah, maybe maybe you just had one or two fields that were high pressure or pocket, and, and those are some prime ways to maybe adjust your rotation uh, to get those under control. Because still, rotation is your your best control method to break those cycles. Yep. So, so right. So we'll, we're going to tweet out a lot of information as we're looking at larvae. I say the next couple of weeks, and we'll tweet out some adult stuff, and we'll have a great summary put together here for our our kind of fall agronomy book that we put together and at Winter Crop Shops. But but certainly, if people are looking for updates, uh, best way to find us on Twitter, Brian, your handle. Uh, at Farmer Buck One. And I am at Josh Schaffner. Brian, where's a good way to find our podcast? Uh, if you go to YouTube and search Our Names and Pioneer, they should all populate right up beneath it. And you can see, you know, the current episode, but also get back into the historic ones we've had in the past. You bet. We've also, we're just in the process of launching a new website uh, that Pioneer is working on to house these. Uh, you'll probably start seeing some links come to that. It's just a really great website with uh, maybe a little bit easier way to find those podcasts and also... Uh, get those to play back for you. So stay tuned for that. We'll be tweeting that out and give you updates uh, for that that new website as well. Well, Brian, that is a wrap for this week's podcast. This podcast is recorded from the Agronomy Bunker Studio in Zimbrota, Minnesota. It is produced by Brian Buck and Josh Offner. This is a bi-weekly podcast. Thanks for listening and be sure to tune in next time. <laughs>